Hello, and thank you for joining the essential building blocks of the Cloud Native Data Stack. My name is Gaurav Rishi, and I'm the head of product at Kasten. I'll talk a little about demystifying a cloud native application, really what's under the covers, and also I'll touch on how do you think about applications like backup and recovery, which fall under the data management category. But I also have a stellar speakers lined up for this. Jay is going to come in right after me to talk about cloud native building blocks and how does Kubernetes give you the power to go ahead and handle state. Right after Joe, we have Dave, and he's going to come in and talk about some of the operational considerations. How do you think about security? How do you think about operating patterns? And that will be a very interesting piece too. And last but definitely not the least is Danny who's going to come and talk about why should you do data management? And what are the key principles to keep in mind? And after you've heard from these folks, we're all going to get together to talk together about what are the customer learnings, some practical advice, and where is this all heading to? So buckle up and look forward to now getting on with this. So let's first of all, take a step back and think about when we talk about cloud native and state, where do these stateful pieces reside? And so this is a simplified view in terms of thinking about how we should be and where the state gets stored. So starting off bottom up, you actually have physical storage. Somehow your data needs to reside somewhere, right? And that could be on premises or it needs to be in the public cloud. And there are a variety of options and it's a growing list of whether it's spinning media or SSD, but that's one layer and that makes up the bottom layer in this particular stack. Right above it, you have block and file implementations for storage. Now block gives you a way to go ahead and have raw volumes. You can have uh, local block storage, of course, and the protocols like iSCSI and Fiber Channel that are used under the covers. And uh, Amazon, for example, has the AWS Elastic Block Store EBS, which is a implementation of this. File storage, on the other hand, is typically shared. You have protocols like NFS and SMB, and if I stick with that example with AWS, it's the EFS or the Elastic File Store, which is an implementation of that. Of course, there are many more implementations from various vendors, and they are all good and they have the pros and cons. Now, the layer above it is essentially the data services aspect of it. Now, this is both relational data services, MySQL, Postgres, SQL implementations that you commonly see, as well as embarrassment of riches when it comes to the NoSQL category of databases, whether they are key value stores like a Redis, whether they're document stores like a MongoDB or white column stores like Cassandra. Now, all of these belong to the modern databases or the data services category. And then another one I'll point out here is object stores or blob stores, which are also considered a part of the data services category in this particular picture. And again, this could be in the cloud or it could be on premises. And then finally, what you really care about is your actual applications. And now the stateful applications, of course, have data which could be written directly into blocker file storage, or it could be written into databases or data services, which in turn then writes it into blocking file storage. And in addition to that, your application Kubernetes also has a lot of metadata information all of the Kubernetes objects, and I'll get into that in the next slide. But the key point I want to also make, as you see this top layer, is there are a few different deployment patterns in which how you think of state. You could have your state as a part of the same namespace in your application, or it could be that you're utilizing a managed database, something like an Amazon RDS, where your data resides. In all of these cases, your state typically has to be and it actually does store somewhere, and that's where you see it. Now let's get into uh, how does a cloud native application actually look? And this is an X-ray of a toy application. This has two microservices. You have a pod connected to a persistent volume and a persistent volume claim, and Joe will talk about that in a bit. And then you have a second microservice, and this could be another deployment where you actually have a database, in this particular case, SQL. The key point here to make is, first of all, there is a state explosion. So in addition to your 
storage volumes, as well as your database. You also have a number of components, 538 of them from a Kubernetes objects perspective. These are things like secrets and config maps and certificates, and you also need to go ahead and store that. So a stateful application, when you look under the covers, is made up of your application data that gets spread across block, file, and data services. You have all of your app metadata, as I was calling it, which is your configuration, the Kubernetes objects. And then you also actually have to think about your Helm deployments, your CI CD pipeline status, and that is also state in terms of your actual application binaries. When you think about operations like backup and recovery, you now need to think about the actual entire Kubernetes application, which is represented by that dotted black line that includes all of the microservices and all of the state components. Don't think about just the infrastructure or just the storage volume that might have been relevant in a hypervisor environment, because now these pods are dynamically scheduled across any one of these underlying worker nodes. And they are extremely dynamic in nature, in addition to having many more instances like you saw in the cloud native application components. And then finally, when you think about handling a backup or a recovery operation, in this cloud native world, you need to think about a coordinated operation. There might be under the covers dependencies where, for example, microservice two should be brought up only after microservice one. And that is something that is extremely important and is a practical consideration to keep in mind. So with that said, let's think about how we can simplify data management applications like backup and what are the different ways of doing it. So if I take that same simple application of a cloud native application inside this dotted blue or black line and think of the two microservices, the few layers are the storage layer, you have a data services layer above it. And of course, above that is your actual application pods and all of the config objects that Kubernetes provides. So one way you can go ahead and think about capturing that information would be exercising what are storage snapshots. So those are typically provided by your storage vendors. Uh, Kubernetes is going ahead and standardizing the APIs with something called the CSI. And Joe, again, will touch on that. And that gives you a way to think about getting things like crash consistency. Um, now, another way of doing the same thing, but at a higher layer, is at the data basis or data services layer. Now, there is a pro and cons around this. So every database has its own set of tools. But if you are looking for higher consistency, and it's always a trade-off between consistency, whether you have any storage requirement dependencies and the performance in terms of whether you exercise that particular tool, like a MySQL dump for MySQL or a Wally for Postgres. But that is definitely a relevant way also. But when you think about Kubernetes deployments at scale, and Dave Strevel is going to talk about that, you need to think about automation. And this is extremely important where you should have a way or a solution to be able to go ahead and automatically discover all your applications, think about what the microservices and configuration objects under the covers are, and then give you the way to go ahead and actually exercise the appropriate tools under the hood, whether it's at the storage layer or whether it's at the data services layer. And all you care about is what the RTO and the RTO time is so that your applications are consistently being backed up and disaster recovery is something which you're in compliance with and you can recover. And now, given that the number of data services, like I said, is an embarrassment of riches and is growing, and every one of them requires a different tool, you also need to be thinking about exercising blueprints as the terminology around open source projects like Canister are included to go ahead and define what the sequence of operations might be when you think about backup and how you think about hydrating it. So with what I have just covered, it gives you a way to think about what a state mean. How do you think about state in terms of where it resides? What needs to be stored when you look at a simple application? And what are the different ways in which you can go ahead and capture that state? But with all of that said, let me now hand it to Joe, who's going to talk about what is it that Kubernetes layers are and what are the different constructs that Kubernetes provides 
to handle state. With that, let me hand it to Joe. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna talk about the essential building blocks of the cloud native data stack. My name is Joe Fernandes. I'm the vice president and general manager of cloud platforms at Red Hat. Uh, which includes our OpenShift Kubernetes platform. And I've been with Red Hat now uh, nearly 10 years. So before I get into this topic, um, I want to talk about you know, what these cloud native platforms are for. Um, and ultimately, I like to think about this in two domains. First, uh, you know, the Kubernetes platform is really about abstracting the underlying infrastructure. And we know users today are running applications on a diverse array of infrastructure options spanning from, you know, physical bare metal servers uh, in their data center, virtualization platforms like vSphere or Hyper-V, uh, private cloud platforms like OpenStack, but also increasingly moving applications out to public clouds like Amazon, Azure, Google, and so forth. And now even moving services out to edge-based deployments. Um, and so uh, users are looking for a way to abstract uh, all of these different infrastructure options uh, to, be, to better manage their applications. The second thing is you know, Kubernetes needs to manage a wide array of applications, right? Uh, and this spans again from traditional uh, enter apps, Java, EE, .NET, et cetera, as well as you know, cloud native microservices that users are, are building increasingly today, but also ranges into things like data analytics and AI and machine learning, as well as third-party ISV apps, packaged applications from various ISV vendors. So when we think about the uh, core building blocks of the cloud native stack, it really starts with Kubernetes on Linux. But as if all you had was Kubernetes and Linux, you wouldn't be able to run very many applications. And anybody who's built a, a you know, Kubernetes platform understands that. It's like having a Linux kernel without a full Linux operating system distribution. Uh, and you know, ultimately, Kubernetes is like the kernel for your distributed system to enable application deployments across a hybrid cloud environment. So again, uh, if you've built a Kubernetes platform, you know you need additional cluster services, whether that's networking to connect your containers, ingress to bring traffic into the cluster, a logging and monitoring to, to manage that cluster and the applications that run on it, and security at all layers of the stack. And if you're gonna run stateful services, you also need storage uh, to back those services. Now, luckily, you know, Kubernetes storage uh, has been around for some time. The ability to leverage things like persistent volumes and persistent volume claims uh, to back stateful services with you know, an array of storage options is something that's been uh, in Kubernetes since the earliest releases, you know, more than you know, four or five years. And with this capability, you can, you can attach you know, everything from file storage to block storage to object-based storage options, depending on what your specific service needs. And there's a number of built-in plugins from traditional NFS to iSCSI, Fiber Channel, uh, cloud storage options from AWS to Azure to Google Persistent Desk, OpenStack, and more uh, to really uh, provide you know, the options that you need to back uh, the services that you want to run. Recently, there's been new innovation in this area, right? So over the past couple of years, the container storage interface has really brought a new standard for how to expose storage systems to containerized workloads on Kubernetes. And the goal of CSI is really to externalize those storage plugins to get them out of the core Kubernetes code. Uh, and they'll ultimately replace the older entry storage drivers that Kube originally started with. And so using CSI, uh, both users as well as storage vendors can uh, can update and deploy storage plugins uh, again without having to uh, to modify the cluster uh, that they're uh, that they're working with, and so again, this provides a lot of uh, flexibility and is is a, a better approach. Another innovation in stateful services, you know, over the past couple of years, has been the advent of Kubernetes operators, and this is something that Red Hat's been in the middle of as well as CoreOS, uh, which Red Hat acquired a few years back. Um, operators leverage Kubernetes custom resource definitions, or CRDs, to embed operational knowledge into those service deployments. And when you talk about stateful services, one of the challenges is they typically have a higher set of concerns around day two management. So if you think about you know, running something like a database or a message queue or analytics or big data systems, 
you generally have human operators like your DBAs or your messaging admins and so forth that are responsible for all of the day two tasks to keep those services up and running. With operators, we're trying to build a lot of that operational knowledge directly into the service so that we can make it more autonomous and self-managing. Um, and then ultimately, uh, those services can, uh, can run uh, more independently. Um, there's a maturity model for operators, which I show across the bottom. Uh, and you can have operators that handle everything from just basic install to upgrades to full lifecycle management, like backup and restore procedures, failure recovery, uh, going into deeper insights around monitoring and you know, logging, and then ultimately getting to that sort of uh, you know, nirvana of a, of a fully autonomous uh, service. We also see a number of stateful services use cases at Red Hat. You know, on our OpenShift platform, you know, we see a lot of different uh, customers running different types of stateful services. Uh, for cloud native apps, you know, we generally think about these as stateless or 12 factor, but there's a lot of supporting services like you know, CI CD pipelines that we see customers running on the platform, uh, registries to manage containers, uh, you know, other data repositories, observability systems like Prometheus that, that require uh, you know, state, right? And you need uh, storage to, to back those services. We also see a growing number of customers running structured data services, you know, SQL and NoSQL databases, uh, data warehouses, you know, other types of uh, uh, stateful services directly on the Kubernetes platform. And then recently a spike in the number of customers running big data uh, analytics and AI and machine learning on the platform. That's been, you know, really quite interesting. Here's just a couple of, uh, of examples of customers who've recently um, talked about uh, the, the AI ML platforms that they're running uh, on OpenShift today, right? So Royal Bank of Canada this summer announced a new platform called Borealis AI uh, that is enabling you know, AI and machine learning for their investment professionals. It's running on OpenShift and we, uh, they built that in partnership with Red Hat and NVIDIA. So it's a, it's a fully GPU enabled platform. Uh, Exxon Mobil uh, spoke at Red Hat Summit about uh, their uh, AI ML uh, platform services that they're running on OpenShift to enable data scientists in oil and gas exploration. And then HCA Health Healthcare has you know, talk, spoken with us a few times publicly about uh, the data-driven analytics platform that they're running on OpenShift to help diagnose sepsis across their hospital chains. Again, there's a number of uh, storage considerations when you think of you know, these different types of stateful services, right? You need to think in terms of um, application-centric uh, storage requirements versus just thinking of storage as an infrastructure concern, right? So depending on the type of service that you wanna run, you need to pick the right uh, storage option instead of supporting services to run that. And again, that could range from file to block to object storage. Uh, and so you need to have a comprehensive solution you also need to run uh, across all the deployment footprints where customers want to deploy those services. And as I mentioned, that could span from the data center out to multiple public clouds, and then uh, even out to the edge. Uh, and this needs to enable an ecosystem of providers of ISVs to bring services to the platform, right? Uh, to bring storage, to bring other stateful services. No one vendor can do this alone. And so ultimately what this results in is all these uh, additional building blocks on top of Kubernetes to enable both application services as well as data services to run successfully. Uh, and you see that uh, every day. We also see a growing number of platform services coming out of the open source community where new innovation is happening above the platform, whether that's Istio to enable service mesh capabilities, Knative for serverless, Tekton for CI CD pipelines, projects like Argo CD for GitOps, see a number of these new platform services and it's very exciting. We also see a number of new developer services and developer productivity tools to enable developers to be more successful uh, working uh, and building and deploying apps on top of Kubernetes. And lastly, we need to make sure that all of these deployments are multi-cluster aware and multi-cluster enabled, right? So customers don't just have a single uh, cloud native platform. They have multiple Kubernetes platforms, Kubernetes clusters uh, and really running across multiple clouds. And so this has to extend into the realm of data services, right? We need to uh, you know, understand what implications this brings as we try to make those data services able to span multiple clusters and multiple clouds as we strive to make them truly hybrid. 
So I will leave it at that and pass it on to Dave, our next speaker. Hi, and welcome to Cloud Native Data Stack Day. Uh, I want to thank Joe for going over storage considerations. Uh, I'll be covering off on Kubernetes operational considerations today. My name is Dave Strabel. I'm a Cloud Native uh, Global Architect at Microsoft on the Azure Global Black Belt team. Recently co-authored a book uh, called Kubernetes Best Practices. If you want to reach out to me and connect with me, you can connect with me on Twitter at Dave underscore Strabel. So when we start talking about operational considerations, there's a lot of different aspects that we have to consider here. Uh, we're going to hit really the highlights on this. We can't go very deep. We have limited time. So I'm going to cover off on security, uh, cluster design for isolation, multi-tenancy, resource management, uh, Kubernetes upgrades, and also the operator pattern within Kubernetes. So when we look at security, uh, there's a lot of different aspects we have to consider about security, and we really have to look at it as more of a layered approach. The first thing is really securing our application before we deliver that application. So we need to do this in our CI pipeline. So before we do a Docker build, we want to scan and make sure that Docker container images is going to be secure and doesn't already contain vulnerabilities before we push it into our container registry. Once it's in the container registry, you are going to want to be able to scan that container registry. As our images get older, we want to make sure there's no vulnerabilities when we're pushing those containers to Kubernetes. We also need to focus on the virtual machine hosts uh, that will be running those containers. Uh, a lot of the managed service providers, they will have you know tools already built in. They'll already do uh, automatic updates on those hosts, those type of security uh, patches. Uh, but we want to ensure those hosts are secure. Uh, if you're running your own Kubernetes, there's other considerations at that host level that you're going to want to consider. The next is really that Kubernetes API surface. The Kubernetes API surface, we're going to have to figure out our authentic authentication authorization strategy, uh, how we're going to manage certificates, how we're going to manage things like secrets. Uh, we also need to think about the containers running on there. At runtime, we also want to be able to detect different type of security threats, uh, different type of vulnerabilities for the actual applications that are running. One of the other aspects is when you're running uh, persistent applications, we also need to think at that storage layer and look at our security requirements if we need things like encryption uh, at rest and those type of things. So when we start looking at isolation, uh, security comes into the fold there too, uh, as we may have consider security considerations, especially around multi-tenancy and hosting multiple apps in a single cluster. Uh, so we need to decide how we're going to do our cluster design and build out. Uh, are we going to go for more of a physical isolation or are we going to go for a logical isolation? With physical isolation is where we more dedicate a uh, Kubernetes cluster to say a team uh, or a project where Logical isolation, we're going to use what are called namespaces in Kubernetes to kind of segregate out uh, our different teams. So in a single prod cluster, we may host team one, team two, team three, and all of their applications in that, um, in that cluster. With logical isolation, we really need to think about the namespaces. Think of that namespace as a logical isolation boundary. It's not necessarily a security boundary because there's still a lot of shared components within Kubernetes. But at that namespace level, I can do things like uh, segment my traffic with network policies. Uh, I can do RBAC at that namespace level. I can set things like um, you know, limits on what a user can deploy to that actual namespace, so how much CPU memory they can use. And I can do that through using resource quotas. So I can set a resource quota on that namespace and say that this team gets, you know, team A gets two gigs of RAM and two CPUs, while team B gets eight gigs of RAM and eight CPUs. Uh, one of the other considerations, just not on you know setting 
uh, those resource quotas at the namespace, I also need to ensure deployments have request and limits. A request allows us to say, this is the minimal amount of memory and CPU I need for my application, where the limit says this is the upper boundary. If I hit that upper boundary, do not go over that. So CPU will get throttled. Your, if you hit a memory limit, it will restart the application uh, and will never over provision your cluster. Uh, we can also, on those namespaces, set limit ranges. So uh, when I talked about request and limits, we can automatically, if your end users don't set that in their deployment manifest, I can set that at the namespace so there is a default. So we do limit that uh, automatically. When we look at updating and upgrading Kubernetes, uh, one of the mo this is one of the most important aspects I'll say because I see a lot of customers struggle with this because Kubernetes is a very fast moving project. Uh, if you look at the Kubernetes project, it maintains release branches for the most recent three minor releases. So right now, 117, 118, 119. Uh, so if you're on Kubernetes 119 and approximately a year, uh, that will end support for that actual release. Uh, new releases come out approximately every three months. Uh, so you really have to be comfortable with doing upgrades and really build an automation strategy around those upgrades and be comfortable with automating those deployments, treating those clusters as ephemeral clusters, uh, you know, immutable clusters that we're not changing, we're uh, building dynamically. Uh, you really have to be good at Kubernetes upgrades because if you start getting behind releases when you move to newer versions or make big jumps or maybe deprecated APIs, uh, there's always new good fixes uh, in each of those minor releases. Uh, so you really need to think of, about uh, being able to automate this so you can upgrade you know, uh, rapidly and be comfortable with those upgrades. Uh, whenever we think about upgrades too, especially when we're running persistent applications, we really need to think about the backup, restore, and DR uh, for those. Uh, when you're doing stateless in a cluster, doing upgrades very easy. I can just redeploy those applications to a new cluster and even do blue-green type deployments. When I have persistence in that cluster, uh, I need to think about how I'm going to back up and restore that data to a new cluster. Uh, pod disruption budgets also come into play when you're dealing with upgrades. So it will ensure that you have a certain amount of replicas available. So when you do that upgrade and drain nodes, it'll make sure and stop any upgrades uh, if you don't have enough pods uh, or replicas available for your application uh, to perform. Monitoring logging, this you could go on for days with, uh, but some key things here to look at is really when you're doing, uh, typically you're doing file logging, you may be logging to like say a disk from the application, uh, you know, a specific directory. And in containers, you really want to log everything to standard out, standard error. Uh, when we look at metrics uh, for clusters, we really need to be able to collect at different levels, say node metrics or pod metrics, uh, you know, storage usage and storage metrics because IOPS latency, all that's going to come in with your persistent applications. Uh, so there's a lot of aspects you have to think. The most important thing is really, you know, focus on this area of monitoring and logging before you go to production with Kubernetes. Uh, this will go a long ways when you have to go troubleshoot and uh, debug issues within Kubernetes. Uh, so last topic, uh, the Kubernetes operator pattern. Uh, so a operator pattern, this definition comes from the Kubernetes website, but the operator pattern aims to capture the key aim of human operator who is managing a service or set of services. The, operation, the operator pattern captures how you can write code to automate a task beyond what Kubernetes itself provides. So essentially what we are doing with this operator pattern is we were building in logic that we would normally manually do. 
Uh, so think of things like, you know, we do deploy an application on demand. There's things like the Elasticsearch operator where I can write a simple uh, YAML manifest that says, hey, deploy me an Elasticsearch cluster. Uh, I could also perform things like uh, backups of that Elasticsearch cluster uh, by defining a just Kubernetes manifest. Uh, so I start building a lot of this logic in around like stateful applications that I need. And this allows me to op uh, automate a lot of these different tasks that I may have to do for uh, stateful services. Uh, that's typically where you start seeing this Kubernetes operator pattern. Uh, because a lot of these stateful applications, there's a lot of different operations that have to happen in sync. Uh, there's a lot of day-to-day -day type management stuff, and I can program that into logic. Uh, this provides a very seamless way to be able to run uh, stateful services on Kubernetes. Thank you for joining, and I will go ahead and hand it over to Danny. Hello, I'm Danny Allen, CTO at Veeam Software, and I'm very excited to be here as part of this discussion around essential building blocks of the cloud native data stack. And I really wanted to touch on two different things. One was data management use cases, as well as essential principles of a good data management strategy. But it's hard to get into the use cases and the best uh, and essential principles without understanding why it is so important. And so if we start with why and look at the threats that every organization faces, these are not new. If you think about cyber threats, for example, we've been faced with cyber threats now for as long as there has been digital systems. And so malware has been proliferating, getting increasingly sophisticated. Or ransomware, in 2020, ransomware has exploded. And so having a good data management strategy clearly helps with addressing and defending against these types of external threats. There's also environmental concerns. I used to worry about drives failing in the data center. But one of the interesting things that is happening is we're now faced with earthquakes and floods and forest fires and hurricanes. And so having a good data management plan in place helps to defend against these types of environmental risks. And then there are the people risks. I do dumb things sometimes. I delete files, I delete virtual machines. I deleted a data store just recently and lost all of my data. So having a data management plan in place can help to address those accidental actions by users. And not always accidental, I should point out. Sometimes we see malicious insiders that are disgruntled and they intentionally cause havoc. Often that is more damaging than external factors. And so having a good data management plan in place helps to address those insider threats. And then lastly, it's not all negative. Sometimes the data management plan helps us plan, helps us with things like business optimization or reducing costs. And so if you take all of these different threats and things that we face that drive data management, it really comes down to three core use cases. The first of these is backup and recovery. No surprise to anyone. We've been doing backup and recovery as long as I can remember. If I go back to my first job, we were doing backup of a mainframe system to tape. Um, and that was over 20 years ago. We have moved on from mainframe to physical, to virtual, to cloud. And now we're talking about cloud native systems. We still need backup and recovery. Resilience at the infrastructure level does not address resilience at the business level of user actions, of malicious outsider threats. And so backup and recovery is something that clearly we need to focus on because we own the data and we need to protect it. Now, it's interesting to me as we go into new eras where we tend to bolt on backup and recovery, we tend to bolt on data protection. And one of the arguments that I would make is that when we look at these use cases like backup and recovery, we need to build it into our systems at the beginning rather than bolting it on later in the game. The second big use case is around disaster recovery. Now disaster recovery often is built in because we're planning for outages or business continuity. And so when we have 
hurricanes and forest fires and floods and data center outages, we want to ensure that we have the resilience that is needed to fail over, but also to fail back to the original location. And so backup and recovery is about getting data back, but disaster recovery is making sure that there's no interruption in operations for the organization. And then finally, we can't ignore application mobility. It's a critical use case. Why do I say that? Because it might be that you're taking workloads and you're putting them in the cloud. In fact, we saw a lot of this three, four years ago. People just pushed everything into the cloud, whether it be virtualized IaaS, infrastructure as a service workloads, or container-based, uh, Kubernetes-based workloads. But the thing that they quickly realized is the cloud is not a charity. They layer in margin. And so we're beginning to see workloads come back on premises. You might move it from a Kubernetes service back to Tanzu uh, Kubernetes grid, TKG, or move it from one cloud to another based on cost optimization. And so these three use cases come up again and again, backup and recovery, disaster recovery, and application mobility. An underlying principle to all of these use cases is to have what they call, what we call the three, two, one rule, three copies of the data on two different media types, one offsite and with no errors. Every one of these is essential. You might have three copies of the data, but if it's not on two different media types, what happens is a corruption in the media results in a loss of data. And so this is one that's often overlooked. People use snapshots, for example, as backup. If you don't have a break in the media type, you are susceptible, you're vulnerable. And so three copies of the data on two different media types, it used to be tape, now and more and more we're seeing object storage and a different model of storage, and one offsite. And the one offsite helps immensely, especially with ransomware and, and, uh, and malware. I can't tell you how many times in 2020 I've, I've talked to organizations that even if they didn't encrypt it, even if it wasn't immutable, simply the fact that they had a copy of their data offsite enabled them to recover the digital service. And so clearly the offsite copy is a, is a core component of good data management. And then lastly, zero errors. I can't tell you how many customers are doing all the right things with 321 but they're ignoring zero. In other words, they're not validating that they can recover the data at the level and granularity that they need it. And so testing and validating on an ongoing basis is again, another essential component of data management. And so what are the five essential principles then of effective good data management? There's clearly more than this, but five that come up again and again. The first of these is app centricity. I tend to think of technology systems by their individual components, but that's not the way cloud native applications are built. Often a cloud native application has many, many microservices with many, many kinds of storage underneath it. It might be structured data, it could be unstructured data, NoSQL, Mongo, Cassandra. Um, they might be using object storage, S3 or Azure Blob, or they might be using message queues. All of these different storage components make up the application as a whole as microservices. Or there could be um, different storage volumes and different secrets that are being used. We need to think about the application as a whole. And when we're managing it, we need to think of it in the context of the value in the application itself. And many organizations fail at this because they look at the different components as individual components and they're not able to actually measure service level agreements or recovery time objectives and many of the things that they're faced with. And so an application centric view is an essential component of data management. The second one almost seems to be the opposite of that, recoverability. Sometimes, and this comes from a legacy way of looking at services, we think of services as these monolithic things. And we don't recognize that when we go to recover, we need to recover a single atomic element within that application. And so recoverability means that you can recover what you need, when you need it, 
at the level and granularity that you need it. So it might be that you're just bringing back a single data volume, not the entire application. And so having a simple way to do this is extremely powerful because it allows you to just select the appropriate point of time or the appropriate component that you want to bring back. Thirdly, operations. It's an essential principle of data management. You need to integrate this into operations and Dave has already touched on this. It's important to ensure that a Kubernetes native backup platform can be used, first of all, at scale, because we know one of the reasons we build cloud native applications is so they can scale. And so we need to be able to provide operations teams with the workflow capabilities that they require because they're under pressure to meet compliance and regulatory and monitoring requirements. And so operators should be able to give self-service capabilities to application developers without requiring application code or deployment changes. So being able to build it into the operations of the organization is another essential principle. The fourth area is around security. Now I talked about security before as the external threat, the malware, the ransomware, but internally, security has a different requirement. Things like identity and access management coupled with role-based access controls have to be implemented. This enables you to give your developers and the DevOps team the least privileged model so that they only get access to what they need access to. You don't want unnecessary damage being caused by a mistake in operations. And so this least privileged model is essential. Also things like encryption at rest, encryption of the data while it's in transit. All of this has to be implemented to make sure that the data is secure. We can't do data management, of course, without effective data security. And then lastly, we need to talk a little bit about portability. And we don't have to go any further than M&A, mergers and acquisitions. If you say I'm all in on AWS, but you acquire a company that is all in, on Azure or on GCP, being able to merge those or manage those together is important. And it's just not, it's not just a multi-cloud world, it's also the hybrid cloud world, being able to move things from on-premises to off-premises. Or even if you're all in on a single infrastructure and that's not going to change, you still need the capability to support multiple distributions of OpenShift moving from 3.x to 4.x. And so portability of workloads, portability of data is also an essential principle in effective data management. And so these five things, app centricity, recoverability, operational integration, security, portability, all of these are essential component of a good data management platform. Thank you everyone for providing a drill into the building blocks of the cloud native stack. We've dived into what state means, where data is stored, operational considerations to deploy cloud native applications, and then protect them. Hopefully this demystified a lot of the concepts and highlighted approaches for you. By now you know everybody on this panel, Joe, Dave, and Danny. So let's dive right into glean some additional practical advice from them. So uh, Kubernetes is enabling greater agility, self-service, and portability to run these cloud-native applications that we just uh, talked about. Uh, Joe, can we start with you to maybe touch on some customer examples on how Kubernetes has helped them meet their business goals? Yeah. So. Uh you know, like you said, Kubernetes is a great platform for cloud native applications, but what we always stress is it's not just for cloud native applications. It's not just for, you know, 12 factor apps, right? Uh, we deal at Red Hat, we deal with a lot of enterprise customers. And so they have traditional applications, monolithic style applications, uh, many of which are stateful, whether that's you know, Java EE or .NET or other services. And then we have customers trying to do new things in the areas of analytics and AI and machine learning and bringing you know, more data-centric services. Um, and you know, the power of Kubernetes is we can enable that full spectrum, right? So, uh, so in my talk on the analytics side, I talked about, uh, or AIML, I talked about the work we're doing with a few customers, Royal Bank of Canada, for example, uh, who announced a, a new AI platform that they built together with Red Hat and, and NVIDIA. Uh, 
to enable sort of their banking applications. Um, at this past year's Red Hat Summit, we had Ford Motor Company talking about how they're bringing a lot of traditional stateful services uh, onto Kubernetes. And that, that drives a lot of requirements to the platform, drives a lot of requirements around storage, around things like GPU enablement, uh, around running on bare metal, because a lot of these workloads want to run directly on bare metal uh, as opposed to Kubernetes on top of a virtual environment. But yeah, I think that's that's the power of Kubernetes is that it can be applied to this broader array of workloads and then the, the community is continuing to evolve the capabilities to support. Yeah, no, that is indeed uh, a lot of variety for, for sure, uh, Joe. Uh, actually, if I can also maybe add to a customer example and put a plug in for uh, Craig King, who's gonna be talking about, uh, <clears throat> you know, the fascinating work that they're doing at uh, Lidos, where they have more than 1600 developers and, you know, they've created a DevSecOps environment to work in secure sort of federal environments across geographies and in fact, across continents. And actually one really fascinating part of this talk is how, you know, functions which we typically thought as day two services like backup and recovery, which I know Danny's talked about, um, are, you know, proverbially shifting left too. So this has actually allowed small ops teams to be able to create, you know, secure golden stacks that can be brought up and down very quickly by baking in functions like backup and recovery right into Kubernetes. So I think it's not only the diversity, it's also a change in how people are thinking about um, getting agility across the entire uh, flow of the application. So, so definitely a lot of uh, rich examples across uh, you know, a wide variety of customers. Um, but with that said, maybe this is a good switching point, uh, uh, maybe Danny for you, since I know you live the, and breathe this. Uh, you've talked about uh, data management functions like backup and mobility as being sort of essential. Um, can you maybe talk about uh, what are the sort of common customer misunderstandings that you see which create problems that we all seem to be seeing as you know, bad headlines every, every, every other day um, in terms of ransomware, et cetera? Yeah, it's funny. We It seems like we go through the same cycles time after time. I go back to my, my first job actually was on a CP6 mainframe and we did back up to tape back then. Um, and we've gone through cycles since then, right? From mainframe to physical to virtual to whatever it happens to be. Now we're talking cloud native. And it seems like we forget some some basic uh, premise to, to our infrastructure and backup being one, security being another one of them. And there is always an advantage to going to the new infrastructure. What's the advantage of cloud native infrastructures? It gives us incredibly incredible portability and, and elasticity, but it doesn't solve for everything. One of the benefits, one of the reasons people go to, to Kubernetes, for example, is the resiliency and, and of the platform itself, but it doesn't solve some fundamental things that exist on all platforms like I unintentionally delete something, or you mentioned security. This comes up all the time and it's near to my heart because I spent a decade in security. We're seeing now malware and especially ransomware that is actually intelligent of the context in which it's running. And so not yet on Kubernetes, thankfully, or on, on container-based infrastructures, but you see malware like ransomware coming in, examining the infrastructure and say, I'm going to go not only wipe out the system, but I'm going to go delete the backups so that there is no recovery from that. And so every time we go to a new infrastructure, what we have to think about is building into the infrastructure, the, the protections that we need. Ransomware is one threat that you face. Stupid people like me deleting things is another threat that you face. So, so all of these things, we have to build it into the platforms because hardware resiliency is not enough. We have to think about the human aspect or the external threat vectors that we face. No, that's that's uh, that's that's really important. And like I said, the uh, mistakes seem to keep coming back. And whether they're accidental or malicious, um, you need a way to be able to go ahead and have a last line of defense. And I think having backup and recovery are sort of the key parts there. Uh, you know, actually, that gives a good segue to uh, uh, to go to uh, Dave because I know operation consideration and security are sort of near and dear to his heart. And um, Dave definitely has advice for people who are looking to write books uh, like he has, um, but that's a separate topic. But um, Dave, maybe I was gonna ask you to dive into one of the things that you touched on in your, um, in your talk, which was around cluster design. And really what I had noticed is when Kubernetes was just sort of starting out, there used to be a talk about having one giant cluster and multiple tenants on it. But increasingly I'm seeing more and more customers using 
many clusters, but with smaller number of nodes in them. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe take a step back and add some color on why that's the case, does it make sense, and any advice that you might want to share. Yeah, uh, and I think this is one of the things users struggle with because there's not just like one way to do it. Uh, you know, like I can't, you can't just say, hey, you need to limit like a cluster to 10 nodes. Uh, you have to think about some of the concerns you're going to have around things like blast radius. Uh, do I want a single cluster that has, you know, thousands of nodes uh, and that's my like single unit of deployment. Uh, things also become much tougher when a very large clusters that are multi-tenant. Uh, you have a lot of things around security concerns. Uh, not every team uh, within your company is going to have the same security requirements. So we have to think about that. Things in larger clusters also like policy and RBAC all become much more complex at that scale. And instead of building out more of a uh, multi-cluster platform where they're more a little purpose built. Uh, you can go a little too far that way where I've seen customers deploy a single cluster for every single app and they have hundreds of clusters. Um, there are trade-offs with multi-cluster too. Uh, you do have to have better, uh, I'd call it operational hygiene uh, and a lot better automation practices. Uh, there's tooling out there that can really help from managing multi-cluster type architectures. Uh, if we take like the GitOps, GitOps methodology, things like that that can help us manage multi-cluster configuration uh, will really help uh, kind of mitigate that operational overhead of multiple clusters. Uh, but you just, it's not that large clusters are, you know, uh, like an anti-pattern or anything. Uh, you just have to be ready for all the things that you're going to have to manage be across multiple teams there. Yeah. No, it's also like it's like uh, finding the Goldilocks size of, of, of that balance. Um, and, uh, and like you said, there is no anti-pattern of uh, one versus the other, but I think it just puts in perspective the spectrum um, of options that are available and meets, meets your needs, which actually, um, if I take a step back, takes us to this question, uh, and I believe almost all of us on this panel have uh, you know, seen paradigm shifts and initiatives which have now become the norm. And I'm thinking of things like the rise of the TCP IP stack. Um, I definitely saw TCP IP rise and video become uh, something which goes on that TCP IP stack or the rise of hypervisors. Um, now Kubernetes, I believe is in the same class and we've crossed uh, the sixth birthday. So one of the questions which I think I commonly get and for a lot of folks who are coming in into Kubernetes, uh, do they view Kubernetes as six years old or six years young? Where do we stand in the maturity curve? And you know, I, I hope uh, we can sort of all, all weigh in since we all touch it. But uh, maybe Joe, I'll let you uh, take, take a stab at uh, looking at it from your perspective because obviously you've been involved in a lot of the initiatives here. Yeah, so look, I, I think at this point, Kubernetes is well established, uh, you know, across the enterprise and across all the major public clouds, right? So I think uh, people are relying on it, including our own customers for mission critical apps um, uh, and feeling that it has the stability, the security and the reliability that th they need, right? Uh, so, but it's also still evolving in key areas. Uh, a few key areas that, that we're focused on, one is expansion into new workloads, right? So even though the Kubernetes core is stable uh, or stable, stabilized relative to where it was, you know, three or four years ago, now you're seeing expansion into these new workloads like GPU enabled workloads, like uh, analytics, like data services. And so, uh, so that's particularly exciting because it's, it's finding new use cases uh, for that platform. The other is in the area of management. So Dave mentioned the importance of multi-cluster management, the best way to sort of drive that automation and visibility across multiple clusters spanning multiple clouds. Uh, we've also driven a lot of work around uh, operators and CRDs uh, to bring more day two management that's specific to each service. Uh, so uh, I talked about that in my session. Um, and then uh, lastly, I'd say a lot of the new innovation is also kind of sprouting above the platform. So when you look at uh, projects like Istio, projects like Knative, projects like 
Argo CD, Tecton, uh, and, and on and on and on Quarkus. Um, there's just a lot of exciting new innovation that's you know, assuming Kubernetes as a base and then really, uh, again, uh, building in new capabilities uh, above that platform to address key use cases and, and key uh, uh, key users at the end of the day, so. Yeah. Dave, Danny, I mean, where, where, where do you see the balance? Uh, how would you think about uh, where we sit in the spectrum today? So I, I'm gonna go with six years young uh, and not because Kubernetes is not a mature platform. Kubernetes definitely is a mature platform. We see tons of enterprises getting value out of it. The reason I say six years young, because we're seeing a lot of new patterns and we're going, starting to go outside like the original use cases that Kubernetes was de, uh, designed for. Uh, so Joe mentioned things around like the operator pattern. Uh, these new patterns are evolving all the time. We have new technologies like service mesh. Uh, and I think that's one of the things customers uh, have to be aware of. Some of the new things coming into Kubernetes are much younger and not as mature there. Uh, but a lot of the patterns already in place are very mature uh, for running production workloads. Uh, so I go with six years young just because it's such a evolving and quick moving uh, space right now uh, that we're seeing a lot of new patterns evolve. All right, that's fair enough. Uh, Danny, I can let you off the hook. Uh, you gotta take a side. Yeah, I, I'm going to go with six years young too. And my reasoning is not, is very similar. And that is, um, it's taken, and, and this is true of every infrastructure, I think it takes five years to eliminate some of the complexity of standing it up, right? So um, it, it's just a fact that up until I'll say a year ago, it was easier to download a LAMP stack and install something and get it going as a monolithic thing. And But we've we've crossed that. I think we're getting into the adolescence of it. But I think it's still six years young because of the complexity. We're only now emerging from the complexity. It's becoming a lot more simple. It's becoming easier to scale. Um, I think it won't replace all of the infrastructures that we have in place. But I do think that we're now at a point where the majority of, of the industry is going to say, hey, this is an option for it. And that's playing out actually just, we look across the customer base. We, there was a survey recently by Enterprise Strategy Group and everyone has different numbers on this, but they did a survey of 700 organizations. 35% of them were using containers today in production and 52% of them were, were using it in some model, some way, form or fashion. So, you know, DevOps, perhaps per before production, but we've crossed that 50% mark in my mind. We're now in adolescence, give it another two years. And I think it will be mainstream across all segments, all verticals. All right, no, that's, uh, that's good to see. I mean, um, just, just, to, just to complete it out, I, I can only say that, hey, look, it's great to be young again. Uh, I'm so happy to be a part of this, uh, uh, you know, groundswell of a movement. And I think it's so exciting to see so much uh, innovation and, you know, customers are definitely adopting it, like you pointed out, Danny. So uh, I know we are sh uh, sort of short on time and we could go on on this. So maybe what I'll do is uh, just very quickly tee up a question just to see with that forward looking thought that uh, you all made. What is that one technology or operational aspect that you're most excited about in the cloud native stack as you look ahead? And maybe Dave, I'll, I'll start with you uh, on this one. Oh, this is the toughest question. Uh, just because there's so much out there that I'm kind of excited about. Uh, but there are things that, you know, that are very simplistic that provide a lot of value. Uh, and I really like simplistic tools. So one of the things I'm most excited about is probably Open Policy Agent. Uh, this can provide uh, policy for Kubernetes and a lot of stuff outside of Kubernetes. Uh, and I've seen it provide a lot of value to customers, uh, especially from a governance standpoint within uh, Kubernetes and the cloud native uh, space. So that is one area, uh, especially around security and governance, uh, that I'm excited to see and see how that evolves. All right, no, I think uh, that's that's right. Uh, Joe, uh, what would your thoughts be? All right, I'll cheat and give you two. On, on the <laughs> operational side, I, I'm, I'm particularly interested, um, Dave mentioned this sort of uh, the kind of the advent or intersection of GitOps and Kubernetes and a project that Red Hat recently jumped into was Argo CD, uh, working with Intuit and others. And we have plans to bring that into OpenShift. We think that's critical for 
uh, for both uh, a GitOps based approach for application deployment, as well as for how you deploy and manage multiple clusters uh, and so forth. And, and so we see use cases on both sides. Uh, the other more on the application side, uh, uh, a project some may be familiar with called Quarkus. And Quarkus is around uh, cloud native Java, right? It's about taking Java, which is you know dominant in the enterprise, you know, there's millions of apps out there and really making it fit a, a container and event driven kind of profile, right? So the challenge with Java is the JVM, uh, but, uh, but what Quarkus is doing is leveraging uh, pre-compiled uh, code uh, using Graal VM, uh, which means that it can be run in a very small footprint, load very quickly, which makes it well suited to Kubernetes environments and to uh, serverless environments where you need to sort of uh, spin up and, and spin down uh, services very fast, uh, driven by uh, you know uh, architectural events. Uh, so, um, so yeah, those are a couple of the projects that I'm I'm excited about. All right, uh, Danny, we'll come back to you then. Uh, well, I, I'm clearly biased, but I'm, I've always been focused on security resilience of infrastructures and systems and, and working for Veeam and, and uh, having the cast and technology. I like the idea of, of shifting security and backup and those capabilities to the person actually building the application. I always say that the biggest benefits that we made over years with helping build secure applications was giving you know secure frameworks to developers as they wrote the application. Well, this is taking core operational concepts like backup, like security, giving it to the DevOps, shifting it left so that they can call the APIs to give the resilience that the business needs. Anytime we try and bolt that on after the fact, it, it typically fails. So I'm most excited by what Veeam and Canister and the various projects that, that look at this are, are doing to solve this problem. Yeah, and, and I can actually draw a straight line from what you said to, to Joe, and I know on my screen right now, just a very short line, but, uh, but that, that's, uh, that's, that's maybe an example of what we are seeing today. Um, you know, we are having so much fun, but I am unfortunately uh, uh, running the clock out on this one. So we'll probably have to stop it here, but I thank you all for you know, spending your time, especially during this um, you know, COVID era to you know, come educate the community, talk about not only what customers are doing, what the building blocks are, but also what might be coming up ahead. So uh, thank you again. And I hope you had as much fun uh, participating as at least I had uh, trying to organize all of this. Thank you.